session. It's a really great conference with a lot of nice talks. I will speak about the rigidity for five endpoint processes, and this is joint work with Alexander Bufetov and uh, Jan Shishiu. So, first of all, uh, Sasha told us already uh, what the rigidity is, but it was the very beginning of the conference, so let me remind you. I will speak about the point processes on R, and the corresponding Borel Sigma algebra is generated by the set of hash functions where A is bounded Borel. And I will consider the corresponding restriction. I take some set C, and my subalgebra will be generated by hashes where I is inside C. Do you hear me? Okay, let's continue. So, the main definition is as follows. I take some B bounded, and if for any such C, corresponding hash function is F uh, R minus B, E, this is the corresponding completion measurable. Then P e is rigid. In other words, here is my R. I take my set P. E. I take some random configuration. I fix the outside. And this is exactly the picture that we've seen at the end of Sasha's lecture today. What he wanted to tell us is, uh, can we see a lot about the corresponding conditioning inside? And uh, my question is, uh, much more simple. Okay, I fixed the configuration outside. Uh, do I have some invariance? And it turns out that uh, in the case of determinantal processes and uh, when we try to generalize uh, slightly uh, the processes, I usually have only one invariant and this is the number of points here. Hence, the definition of the region. Uh, perfect. Now it seems that uh, we've mentioned during the conference several times the uh, orthogonal processes, but uh, if I'm not mistaken, we didn't mention the preference, so let me uh, recall what do we have here. So uh, we've seen several times uh, that if I start, say, with GE, then I consider the corresponding distribution which is just the product of the square of the Vandermont times the product of the weights, Gaussian weights for GE. And we know that this is written just, can be written just as the determinant of the And when we have the corresponding Christoffel Darbu kernel for the orthogonal polynomials with this particular weight. Now, if I want to move forward, I can consider GOE, Gaussian orthogonal ensemble, or GSE, Gaussian symplectic ensemble. And in this case, what I have here will be product of the modulus times 
the weight and in the symplectic case, when we have, uh, here we have real symmetric matrices and here we have uh, quaternionic matrices, I will have the product of the fourth powers. It turns out that we can rewrite it, uh, not as a determinant, but as a fathen. I will recall what is a fathen in several minutes. Of some kernel, let me, uh, I have, let me put for a moment one here. So this is the first, uh, here our, this is a beta ensemble with beta equal one, and here we have beta ensemble with beta equal four. So I will put one here with some x, y, and this will be k4 with some x, y. As, and as in the determinantal case, uh, I have this formula for the corresponding distribution. But if I have a projection or a kernel of the projection, then I can integrate out my variables one after another. And what I actually get is that all, not uh, only uh, here I have the determinant of Pfeffin in my case, but for all correlation functions, I will have similar formula. So it will be K X, oh, sorry. Lambda I, lambda J I, K from one to K. And so we can generalize it and get the definition. If there exists such a kernel that I can write all my correlation functions in such a form. Sorry? Ah, uh, yes. I will tell it just in a second. So, what is Pfeffin? I take a skew symmetric matrix, A transposed is equal to minus A. We can uh, write some kind of normal form, for example, this one. Then we definitely have that the determinant of A is equal to the determinant squared of B. And as I can get this by elementary transformation, in fact, what I have that my determinant as a polynomial with respect to the elements of matrix is a square of some other polynomial. And this is a definition. I should tell what my sign is. And the usual convention is that the Pfeffin of J is one, where J is matrix of this kind. And you can see that if the size of matrix is odd, then both sides, uh, then I have zeros on both sizes here. This is not an interesting case. And so we'll consider only the case when the sizes of matrices are even. Perfect. We have the definition of the first endpoint process, and we can move to the results. Uh, there are several results on the rigidity for the determinantal point processes. Uh, the first result on sign point process is due to Gosh, how Sasha told us already, and there is some general proposition due now to Sasha. And uh, we're mainly interested, our first interest are the corresponding universal processes, signs, Bessel, area, so on. And they're covered by this proposition as well as some other. Uh, if we're moving from the determinantal case to the Pfeffin case, uh, then we'll have uh, several uh, difficulties, and as we will see just uh, soon. And uh, so at the moment, we don't have uh, some general proposition at our disposal, and uh, 
what we can do, we can prove rigidity just case by case. And so results. Uh, our first theorem is that uh, we distinguish these two limiting cases. We have sine one five n processes, uh, point process, and sine four point process. Uh, these processes are rigid. And our second result is if we consider corresponding Bessel processes, Bessel one point process and Bessel four point processes, and then these processes are also rigid. Uh, how one can prove rigidity of a point process? Uh, main tool is the following proposition. It's due to Gosh and Paris, as well as the definition of the rigidity. I take any B bounded, and if for any epsilon I can construct a function f that depends on B and epsilon, of course, such that my f restricted to B is identically 1, and the variance of the corresponding linear statistics with respect to the uh, point process is less than epsilon, then P is rigid. I recall that the linear statistics is just the sum of the values over my configuration. Yes, yes, I wanted to come to this. Uh, so, in fact, if we speak about sine process, uh, so our main tool is this proposition, and sine processes can be done using this tool, but nevertheless, sine processes are translationally invariant. And in this case, we also have another nice tool to deal with the rigidity. I'll try to come back to this tool at the end of the lecture, and also for the sine process, we have a uh, more general result due to uh, Chaby and uh, no, it's uh, impossible. And Nudge-Nadel, it says that, in fact, sine beta processes are rigid. Okay, if I want to use this proposition, I need some nice formula for the variation. What the variation of the SF? It's definitely the expectation of the square minus the square of the expectation. And you see that here we can just use the definition of the first correlation function, and uh, uh, here it's close to the definition of the second correlation function. I want to rewrite it in some peculiar way, and to be sure, let me just rewrite it. So what we actually get is the integral of f squared correlation function plus the integral of the second truncated correlation function. And minus one half 
integral. Wait times the gated correlation function again. Why do I write it in this particular way? Because it turns out that this term is usually zero. Let me write it as a separate just plus the integral of seconds truncated. And this property is called perfect screening. In the book of Forrester on log gases. Uh, let me say, just for sure, that the second correlation function truncated is the second correlation function minus the product of the first ones. So here we have the second correlation function if uh, the particles doesn't fill each other. And so now we see the, how far we are from the independent case. Uh, to use it now, we need the formulas in our cases. And first of all, let me remind uh, what is the, let me write it maybe here, what is the second truncated correlation function. Uh, if I am in the determinantal situation. I should write the determinant And what I get is actually minus k x y k y x. So what is written here? My star is just the statement that integral of k x y k y x dy is equal to k x x. That is this perfect screening in the determinantal case is just equivalent to the statement that we have a kernel of a projection. And we remember that uh, sine, airy, Bessel, and we have a lot of examples when we have even an orthogonal projection. Uh, what do we have in a Pfeffian case? And I will write it here. Uh, even in the symmetric situation. So what about the Pfeffian? I will probably just write you the answer. My second truncated correlation function has a very nice form. It's just minus determinant of my kernel. And I forgot to tell you that so define the path endpoint process, I need an even matrix. And the usual way to do it is I just say that I have a matrix kernel. My corresponding kernel is just some two by two matrix, M1, 1, by M1. So on, I have two by two matrix. It's definitely we can take a determinant of this two by two matrix, and what we get is the second correlation function. Uh, now, do we have the perfect screening in the Pfeffian case? Uh, now, just a very short. Digression in the 
determinantal case, uh, we have a general theorem of existence, Maki Soshnikov theorem that we heard probably yesterday. And if in the Pfeiffian case, uh, there is no such theorem. And in fact, uh, it seems that there will be no such theorem. And we have either some explicit construction of a Pfeiffian process, or we can obtain one by uh, going to the corresponding limit. Now we're speaking about the limits, and it turns out that if we start with this orthogonal or symplectic ensembles, then we have some particular form of the limiting kernel. I will write it in case k equal 4 because it's a bit simpler. Let me write it like this. Say it will be m x y m y x. This is the derivative y and this is the integral from y to x of m x p. And a short proposition. If my m, if this element is pro a projection itself, uh, plus some additional constraints that always hold, then Okay, the whole kernel is also the kernel of a projection. How do we see it? Uh, we multiply row by column. First, we obtain an element like this. And this is just the standard reproducing property. Or we multiply derivative by an integral. We integrate by, by parts. We always have in our situation some. Uh, uh, we have no additional term uh, because uh, uh, everything is zero at the infinity, and thus this is sufficient. The first and the easiest example. is the symplectic sign process. Here we just have sine pi minus y over minus y. And here we have the derivative. This is by definition my sine for x y kernel. And we see that in this case, indeed, what we have here is just the standard sine kernel. So it is a projection. So we have that this, the corresponding operator here is a projection, and it easily follows that we do have this perfect screening property. And coming back here, we have zero here, and our actually what we actually have is just uh, let me maybe write it also this blackboard. In this case, my variation is just uh, minus. 
uh, no minus. Okay, I have a nice formula at least for this particular case. Uh, now I want to construct. Let me recall that I have a proposition and I need to construct a function with small variance. Obviously, it's sufficient to do it just for the increasing set of intervals. So I take an interval from minus r to r. I say that my function is one here. I will say that it is zero if x is sufficiently large or sufficiently small. And it turns out that logarithmic decay is sufficient. Namely, uh, let me write phi of x. So what do I have? It is one where modulus x. Oh. And uh, uh, x minus one divided by the logarithm of yes, it seems that everything is correct. First of all, let us briefly see what do we have in the determinantal case. What I actually have is the double logarithm. Let me put one over n of t minus r plus one squared here. Um, okay. In fact, uh, I consider the case when x and y are greater than zero. It turns out that I actually have uh, several domains of integration. And the only interesting part uh, is as I have the Different squared is just the part where I have non-zero term either here or there. It is this one. So what do I have? The difference of two functions of such kind. That is x minus one. Squared times. Now we can get a simple estimate that what we actually get is just constant over the square of the logarithm. I will rewrite the first part as just. And I will forget about the sign. And let me rewrite this part just as the double logarithm. Uh, okay. Dy over y. Here I have lambda minus one squared lambda. This is from r to t, and I forgot about the square of the logarithm and lambda is just x over y. So I have 
one logarithm here, but nevertheless I have the square of the logarithm of the denominator, and this part is convergent, so tends to zero when uh, t tends to infinity. Perfect. I just got some nice estimate of my kernel, and that's it. And it turns out that we can generalize this argument that it works for uh, most of uh, the determinantal kernels that we're interested in. Now, let us look at the Pfeffian case. What do we have here? First of all, we have, uh, we're interested to take the determinant of this 2 by 2 matrix and put it inside the same integral. What do we get? The square of the sign is just the same. Uh, this integral we can write just as the difference of a constant minus some integral of y minus x to infinity. This is of and the integral, this is of the size when, when the denominator is bounded. And what we get after the differentiation, we will have a sine over x minus one squared. We can forget about it. It's, everything is also convergent here. And cosine over x minus y. What I want to tell you, that if we're interested in the variance of my S phi with respect to P sine four, then the only part I'm interested in is of the following form. And once again, it's constant over logarithm squared of t. What can I do in this particular case? I rewrite it as And you can easily see that I can integrate out cosine from this formula and I obtain, a, once again, an estimate of the form <laughs> But let us look carefully at what has just happened. Okay, now we are happy because we have the kernel of such form. We can just integrate it out. And because of these rapid oscillations, we have an additional term in the denominator and everything is okay. But if you think about some, any more general kernel, there will be no such a tool. You will have some oscillations and you shall deal with them somehow to obtain a result of similar kind. And uh, if we now pass to the Bessel case. Oh, okay, let me write you. So this will be, say, M Bessel for x, y, and we know what we have all other places. My M 
vessel oh. uh, it is just how to write let me write k vessel to xy so I have the standard determinant of vessel kernel here as in the case of the sine function plus some additional term. I don't want to write it explicitly. Let me write it like m1 of x m2 of y. And it means, first of all, uh, well, it doesn't mean, but we can suspect that something happens if my m x y is a projection, then my k is also a projection. If I have some additional term, it's not that obvious how we can get a projection in a result, and actually we doesn't. And it's not a miracle. Well, I have a sequence of finite dimensional projections. I'm interested in the limit. And, well, what I get in the limit is not a projection. It, it happens sometime. But, nevertheless, uh, what we get as a result, my perfect screening in the Bessel case, it doesn't work. It's just, it doesn't happen, so to say. And, uh, in fact, uh, uh, most of these formulas are written in Professor Forrester's book on log gases, initial formulas for the Pfeffin kernels. And if we combine several passages from several parts of the book, actually it is written that it should hold. And we expected that it is, but in fact, it doesn't. So we needed some some additional step to deal with the first integral, if you remember it. And it turns out that we have uh, a weaker integral version that is just the corresponding integral. Well, is zero in our case. And it is sufficient to deal with the first term. But moreover, let us come back for a second. Uh, we have just one summon here that was difficult to deal with. If we have an additional term here, and then we have integration, differentiation, and everything, we have a lot of terms we should deal with one by one or in some more clever way. We have a number of propositions how we can estimate such integrals, but nevertheless, it's, it is a long paper, and so at the moment only sine and Bessel cases are done. Uh, I have, say, five more minutes, right? Or even six more minutes, perfect. In fact, uh, if we consider sign process, which is translation invariant with more or less simple formulas, then uh, uh, we can deal with it in several different ways. And it turns out that there is uh, a nice idea to pass to the corresponding Fourier transform. So we can consider the OK, so if something is translation invariant, definitely we have that the first correlation function uh, is just equal to some rho. The second correlation function is six. Rewrite is just say. Uh, 
And now we can consider the second truncated correlation function once again. Will be just and now we take the Fourier transform, my second correlation function, and it turns out that we have the uh, sufficient criteria for the translation invariant processes, namely if we uh, subtract my row, uh, sorry, we should add my row, the result should be positive, and um, nom, nom, nom. how to write, let me rewrite it like this, I put lambda. Uh, nom, nom, nom. What I want to say that actually we have only one parameter here, let me say puts, I don't know, z here, z here, and so only one parameter here, and uh, my, there will, should be some linear bound, there exists c such that I have such bounds, and it means that the corresponding translation invariant process is rigid. And probably I will stop here, thank you. <laughs>